Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and yeah, the, the step from runes being an alphabet, which is what I think it is, to it I will argue magical. against it all day. So this yeah, is okay. going to be good. There we go. Exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. So this will be all right. So already we're off on a good, one. Ding, ding, good yeah. no. So John uh, from Crackenford, uh, since you started with saying why you think it's an alphabet, yes. Uh, so let's begin with talking about why you think it's an alphabet. We'll we'll start with that. Um, rather than the the symbols meaning things, I, I think it is a evolution of an alphabet. And um, probably I would go with, and again, this may be contentious to some, Jackson Crawford's more recent view from a few years ago, I think it was, where he talked about uh, this probably had significant influence from the Alpine uh, regions, uh, and then probably some other input from Greek and uh, Roman alphabets due to the location of letters A and Omega in, in uh, in, in the alphabet, which is, I think the Roman one was at the start and the Diomega is the Greek ones at the end. And it just seemed, he said that was, seems like it's just been added on later to a, to a group of letters. Um, and so okay. from that view, it, it just seems like, you know, these, these were developed as you know, an evolution of, of, of letters that, uh, you know, and it's only when they're put in the context of words, they become magical. And, and we see that in other languages. So that is my limited in view on it so i'll let scott no worries okay mind. so um yeah recently how how old is the is the latest the oldest now uh rune that we've we've found scott i think it's the one that was well the oldest inscription ever yeah didn't they recently um, find one that went like a few hundred bc or something like that no, I mean the only the only one that's like a couple hundred BC or BCE um, is the Nagao helmet, and it's questionably even Germanic. I mean, it's really like that's it's actually an Etruscan, um, but the uh, the alphabet is the Etruscan alphabet, um, but the language is Germanic. Um, but the the one that's typically cited is the Meldorf brooch, which is dated to about fifty C CE. Um, but people still go back and forth on that too. You know, they're like, is this actually runic or is it, is it not? So, um, and then we start getting over into like the, the Krawu spear and, you know, that's like into like the two hundreds. And so right around there. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. For some reason, I was thinking there was like a grave or something from like two or 300 BC. Uh, well, there was a coin, wasn't there? Was it was just the first mention of Odin, but that's 400. Mm -hmm. and the comb as well. I think the comb is probably the most common. Yeah, they're the most common. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, so, yeah. All right. So uh, there's the Wodenaz. Maybe you're thinking of the Wodenaz Bracteate that was just recently discovered. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But runically, I mean, that goes back to, I would still have to say around probably off the top of my head, <laughs> uh, probably like 100, 150, oh, okay. maybe even 200 um yeah i mean it's clearly in in the elder Fifth arc and it's clearly in a language close to proto-germanic people actually don't understand when they say i hear this all the time oh these runic inscriptions are in proto-germanic that doesn't make any sense because proto-germanic by its very definition is a proto-language meaning mm -hmm. that none of those words actually physically exist so i just wanted to clear that up too okay um, but i, I yeah, think that's, that's what cool. is the um that Bracteat that was recently found. Like, I am a man of Odin. Okay. So, uh, how old uh, is, do, do either of you know, what's the oldest Greek or uh, Latin script? It would be later than 600. I was okay. good because I mean, the beginning of time, like history is about, the, it's the Olympic Games, the first Olympic Games. That's when history starts in Greece. From myth because that we, we can sort out dates from that point on you know, okay and so, so, so what's so the dating on that uh, that's well that's about six that's 600 okay um the, the, uh, for rome it's 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 probably near i don't know 300 i'd guess maybe 200 bc i'd, I'd happy to be corrected but i would guess based on greeks going to rome and you know the etruscans before then um yeah, because it's the Etruscans, I believe, alphabet is the one that influenced like these Alpine uh, alphabets that then influenced the Germanic or, or, or the runes as we see them. Yeah, so the Etruscans yeah. are uh, the oldest Latin script is Etruscan. Um, 
Well, it's a North okay. Italic script, but yeah. Okay. So that, that'll be helpful for the audience to understand a little more of that. All right, so Scott, um, now that John's given his argument uh, of why he thinks uh, it's alphabetical, uh, let's get in with you as to why you think it is not alph an alphabet. Well, it is an alphabet, but the thing is, is that the original word rune, which has been discussed at length so much, um, I believe that it did not mean letter. And that's where Jackson says, you know, it originally meant letter, whatever. It doesn't. I have proof. It's, it's right here. Yeah. Um, so the original word was just simply secret mystery, which we know, but it also meant song and poem. And we know this because we find the quote unquote proto Germanic form um, in Finnish as a borrowed word. So I like to look at borrowed words like that, you know, because borrowed words don't typically, um, respectfully, don't typically change meaning over time. They're kind of like frozen. So if you think about the word deja vu, um, it really has like one meaning and it has been very consistent, right? We borrow these words for those reasons. For So um, so with Finnish, uh, I did a lot of studies regarding Proto-Germanic loanwords into the Finnish language. And one of them is runo. And it doesn't have anything to do with writing. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the script. And it's actually the title of all... Now you can maybe help me out here, John, because I'm going to be talking about myth. It's tied to the myths within the Kalevala. So the title of uh, all of those songs in the Finnish language is runo. Yeah, and, and runa is yeah. The, the, the word which evolved, I think, into runo. The, yeah the, and so yes. basically um and what i want to want to say real quick too is because there's an argument that that word isn't rune it's something else it is rune like i said i've looked into it and um so for our linguistic nerds out there uh when it was borrowed it was a, a long u runo but then finished it became actually runo so the u became short but that's systematic it does that with all kinds of other long vowels too um so it started off with that vocal component of mystery and myth and poem and song. And then these ideas and, and sound, right? These ideas were then encoded in the di different runes like fehu, orus, thorisas, and so on and so forth. So I'm not saying that it's like wrong that it's a writing system. You know, I'm just trying to say that um, originally the rune was more than just the writing system. It made up more components than that. And those those traits were sort of, um, I guess, infused basically within the runes, which is why we also have rune poems, right? Yes. So, and I don't believe that rune poems are simply mnemonic. I mean, they are mnemonic devices for sure, but they're not as simple as A is for apple, B is for banana, right? Okay. We're talking, yeah. you know, it's I a mean, story. So the, yeah. yeah, there are stories tied within mm. these runes. So okay. that's where I stand on it. Um, and I, I get a lot of I get a lot of pushback with it too. No, yeah. No, it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's a multifaceted uh, item. It's not just an alphabet. It's not just written language, but it's something used for multiple things. And it means the definition of the word rune is uh, is a secret. There. So one of the things I I tried to find out and I couldn't before this is um, when was the word rune started to be used? You know, so. If for, for me, for example, if you could show the rune, the word rune didn't exist till five or six hundred CE. Like after the runes existed, then you see the magic being applied to them later. And I think that's possibly what's happened Could, because most writing we see, most the first writings we normally see are poems. And the reason they're poems is because most of the stories, the important stories, the religious stories, were were poetic in form. We, we see that in the Rig Veda and, and in the Sumerian myths and, and Babylonian myths in Greek and Roman. It's all poetry everywhere. And and that's because I thought that's the only way people remember how to tell stories before writing. So when writing comes along, you write down your poems because that makes sense. So I don't see, and, and without doubt, you know, we, we see... The Celtic people, we believe they were pure or purely oral in history and Germanic. Hecatus, I think, right, saying the Germanic people were pretty much just 
were all all the transmitters of stories they didn't use writing so we do well do we see runic written poems early on do or do we see the development of the word rune or to me it's just that there were these magic words in in scandinavian and then writing came along and the the magic words were associated with the letters afterwards is, is that i i want to stop right there there's a perfect okay. point yeah i agree with what you're saying actually it's like a medium of a, a tool in a way right a tool or a medium of communication for divine communication in its earlier stages it was definitely divine communication you don't find any banal boring inscriptions really um in the in the earliest stages you only find that later with like the bergen inscriptions that are more like mon- well i won't say mundane because they got some pretty feisty ones <laughs> and sexual you know messages and stuff like that um but yeah no i would say uh the word is very powerful so we can talk about that for a second of course um and when we say the word we're not talking about the written word necessarily at all right um so we're talking about the physical spoken word and that did have power and it still does have power i'm convincing people or not convincing people right now right so it it does have that sort of power and we see that in the sources so you know if you look at um uh i think it's fofni small where uh, Sigurd says that he doesn't reveal his name to Fafnir because it was believed that the, that the word still could have, uh, if somebody knew your name, sorry, then they could have power over you. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it, it all plays into that. It's just that the, the runes um, are kind of like one component. That I should say that the written rune is basically one component to the actual rune, if that makes sense. Yes, but, but <laughs> that that component exists after the runes were already formed you know i.e so the words were yeah, already yeah, exactly. in the culture writing comes along and is another tool to use and that's what and we see that if you like in all cultures when writing exists it's the priests who read it and the priests are considered magical because they have this power of words yeah 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 also, i mean even like it says you know in the beginning was the word the gospel mm-hmm. of john and you have the old Saxon Halion where it says in the beginning was the word of God and then to the Christian audience. But then it says in the beginning were the great, you know, the word has power and that, that there's no question that the word has power. And um, so before the, the written word with written runes or whatever, you would speak runes, for, for example, or speak words, speak runes, and they had power. And then later on, it was sort of like encoded into the physical letter rune. So that that's all I was just saying. Okay. So so from that point of view, then, would it be right to say that a written rune has power, or it only has power if it is then spoken? I'd say both. Oh, okay. That's I would say both because it depends. I mean, hmm. Yeah, I would I would say both. Of course, the written word's going to have power. To, and obviously, has power too. So why wouldn't it actually? Well, if it's just written down, because I say the spoken word has power, and that, that's common folklore as well. We have fairies; you never tell a fairy your name or they do evil things to you. And this, that, I get, I get that. But when it's written down, surely just having it written down doesn't have the same possession of power of a word. I mean, I, I, I don't dis- know because, like, you could probably find examples of magical practices where they write someone's name down and then does they do something to it and then they burn it. Right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But that, that's I don't know. That's more folklore world rather than sort of myth religion. Well, Re- the division between operative yeah, magic and religion. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know that you know that whole can of worms because that's your area. But yeah, 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 I'm, yeah I'll get quite strict. So, on that. so. I think what John might be trying to get at, Scott, is what separates a word of power from an ordinary word. Intent. Okay. So how do we know it's intent? Is the intent the ritual that goes around the writing of the word or the ritual that goes about the serving of the word or both? I don't know. Like, are you talking about like ritual instructions that are that are in a book versus the so performative it's, aspect? It's, yeah, you've got, you got things like the Rig Veda, which is poetic, and, and when I read it, or, or when it's read... I'm not aware of any sort of magic meant to be coming from it. So there's no sort of intent there. It's just a message of sort of the myth. However, we do see ritual reconstruction of the myths being told. So sacrifices is a prime example. 
you know, in the beginning, there was two characters, one sacrifices the other and builds the world. And then every sacrifice we see after that is in effect a mini representation of that. They sacrifice an animal and, and either offer it to the gods and to the important people and, and, and cut it down like that. And it's in effect, is a retelling of the creation myth. So when it comes to then the runes of writing things down, if we wrote down, for example, if we could write down the old Norse creation myth as runes, would that have any magical power to it? Again, because I think it just depends on the, the you're talking about the you're talking about the Rig Veda where you're talking about stories within myths and then ritual stories within myths and ritual instructions within myths. Um, there's nothing performative there at all. There's no intent in the outer world, if you will, from let's say the practitioners. Um, and you're only going to, and you're going to probably disagree with me here, but you're probably going to only find that ritual can be effective if you're actually performing it. So it has to be a performance. It's not going to be, it, it can be effective in a different way if it's in a story to maybe provoke and e evoke different emotions or something. I don't know. But the ritual is performed, it is a reenactment of myth. And to me, that's. Yeah, no, of course it is. So I don't, I don't, I, I guess I still don't unfortunately know the question because if you see it in a book and it's written down, um, it's not going to be performative until it's okay. well, actually I'm, I'm performed. Trying to get this, uh, is, is what, what makes intent. So, so people say runes are magical or some people say runes are magical. My understanding is how do they become magical then? Because anyone just write okay. that, what does that intent? Yeah. I mean, it, does it come in a little box you open up and say, oh, here's some intent, or is it how you say them? No, is it, no, exactly. I mean, so it, I mean, so yeah, okay. I, I guess the question's simpler than I was trying to wrap my head around it. So uh, runes are not inherently magical. I'm sorry. I don't think so at all because there is no necessary intent. If there's something on on Amazon and let's say it's like three Fehu runes written or something like that, and you just go buy it and put it around your neck, what are you doing? It's just, you know, consumerism bullshit. So you know, but, you know, it's like, if you, and you are intent is to, I mean, I don't know what would be a common, I don't want to say like get money because it's like so fucking overused. Um, but like, I don't know, your intent well, your is, to, is to be reborn into the afterworld. I mean, that's a common intent. All right, fine. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, then your intent might be to work with that magical system for that purpose. And how do you do that? Well, first off, you need to really be close to like a rune master, someone like A.L. Scott Lagrimson in Iceland. You need to really know your system. You really need to know what you're doing. And then that intent goes into the runes as you're carving them. For example, when you're carving them, you're sort of like, again, almost imbuing some form of hamingya and your intent and your emotion. And then when you color it, um, you know, that intent is there too. Maybe the coloring actually has some of your own blood in it, right? So like these really deep connections, really deep intents. And it's very important to remember that you're kind of working in a mythic context too. Like you were talking about with ritual and performance. Do you like for Havamal, right? Do you know how to color the runes and carve the runes? Like you're working with that mythic context too and almost mirroring mirroring that. So um that's what I mean. I, not 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 something just like, well, my intent is to get rich, so I'm going to buy these three Fehu runes on Fehu runes on Amazon. Um, more, but like real yeah. deep rooted, you know, deep seated rather intent. Yeah. Okay. So and that's quite interesting. So one of the my other beliefs about the runes, uh, and it goes. Um, we discussed this in, in, before we, we we came on like a month or two ago, is around the meat of poetry. So we see this drink being used in many rituals across the Indo-European landscape and, and it's been seen in, in Neolithic uh, agricultural cultures as well of the drinking of a libation. Um, now, whilst it isn't um, sort of obvious what that libation is in terms of the Hovamul and what Odin is doing, it certainly can be interpreted as a shamanistic ritual and we, we are very familiar that shamans like use mushrooms within their, their sort of culture. So there, there is a, a thought that that may mean that you're in a certain state of mind whilst using those rooms and having that intent. Now, is that something you feel is an essential part of getting magic from runes, or is that just, yeah, you know, it's not, it's just a shamanistic thing or? Oh, that's, that's probably one of the toughest questions I've been asked. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, my view on this, um, do I think it's required? No, I don't, I don't think it's required at all. Um, but when it comes to things like that, um, and drug use, essentially, I, they, that sounds like, you know, ominous. I don't mean it that way, mm -hmm. but let's say, let's just use the, um, psilocybin as an example, the mushroom. I believe that it can be used again as a tool to work with as a spirit ally, very animistic. So, and what you can kind of do is see what that spirit ally has to offer you in, in a sort of direction. It'll give you direction. So this is the difference between working with a spirit ally, something like the mushroom and abusing the spirit ally. So if you form this sort of relationship as you're working with the spirit ally and you're working with runes and it reveals something to you and that is very helpful to make you work on your runic magic and runic intent that's kind of personal belief again that is kind of like what i believe where it's just kind of a friend showing you how to see things and get better with it if you do it every single time again that's abuse because you know you're literally doing mushrooms every single time you cover a rune like so that that's again so people and might say that's UPG. You, yeah fine. They look at the um oh i call it yeah. delphi yeah, and i don't have a problem with people doing that i just want to be clear like it's just but that's my personal relationship and personal view of all that okay so, so so that's interesting so because we see within the semi-culture um in effect not rune masters but mushroom masters or even mr city i don't know so and they they have different mushrooms for different intent as you, you call it different yeah you know, exactly different women and, and so men why is a different intent right it's it depends on how that spirit ally is talking to that person how they want company. people to react to it so so yeah so part of me thought is it that we've lost that role within society um, as, as culture and religions change, is it is it that where people talk about room masters now? I don't know if room master was a thing that we see in the old Norse texts uh, or, or mushroom masters in the old Norse texts, but you know, but where where we see seers or seeresses, to me, I think they're a combination of both of those forms. I just wondered if that's something that could be well, possible. It, before I forget, um, the, the what I'm saying is that this spirit ally can show you the way, right? I've already sort of like mentioned that. And the, the thing is, is that the reason why I say you don't have to be dependent on it afterwards is because you're already being shown once. You should be theoretically able to get to that state without using the mushroom once you have first experienced it and understood. So that that's, again, my take on it. Um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, we're talking about mushrooms right now because I uh, don't have my book here, but I've, I'm going mushroom hunting today. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's uh, like really coincidence. Um, it's just really, uh, really funny. I'm going to be hunting for uh, um, velvet foot mushrooms today. It's a winter mushroom. It's kind of interesting. And they're only, they're just meant for cooking, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah it's just yeah, weird that we're talking about mushrooms and I actually have been reading a lot about them lately. I just collected like 45 chanterelles in, in California, like a few weeks ago. <laughs> So, so, but you know, say, so we go back. So, the reason I'm saying this because I was in Scandinavia a few weeks ago and I came across someone who'd just been spending time with a Sammy and they were talking about these mushrooms and, and alike. And I just wondered, is that, you know, is, is that a role you think could have existed within separately or as a, as, as a seer or a prof, you know, a priest figure? Yeah. I mean, I mean, not... obviously, I, I think so. And anybody yeah. who's done real divination, um, you know, not just like, Put a bunch of runes in a bowl and pick one out and ask a question i mean you know like some sort of like never mind i'm gonna say something offensive um <laughs> but if uh if somebody's ever done real like sort of divination and spent a lot of time on it getting into a particular mindset and, and getting into the ritual space and doing all these different things um they know that sometimes those those i'm gonna just call them spirit allies those allies in this case the different mushrooms can help anybody who has ever done that kind of work on a very serious level will tell you that mm. um again i don't think that you want to be dependent on it as a substance though and that's the big difference um and like for me for example 
something uh, I use, I don't usually talk about personal practice, but I guess this feels natural um, to transition into this. Something I use is um, mugwort. So it's very common. I mean, you can go get it somewhere. And so that also tells you right there, it doesn't need to be some like super crazy hallucinogenic drug that you need to, to use to get into that frame of mind. Um, you want to actually still be somewhat cognizant, you know, um, and uh, mugwort is just something I use to help me get into that frame of mind right before I start doing the divination. And I just put it on some charcoal and just breathe it in. And it just helps me a little bit. Uh, but it's it's more about like that, that strong relationship I have with that herb, you know, that helps me with yeah. the divination. And the environment, I'd imagine. I mean, because you, you see people, you know, I would no way, you know, suggest people take mushrooms. You know, certainly they're illegal. But, but um, I, I certainly believe the environment. So it's dancing and singing and with the right people and the hype and hysteria and, and things like that. You can create an environment as well to, you know, that, that makes you, see or divine or whatever yeah you can I, there's no question about that um but like you know a, a friend of mine who's um she's been doing this for a very long very very long time uh she's practiced actual shamanic works with indigenous tribes um and she's um also very much involved in, in germanic practice um and she had told me that's all she needed to do was try mushrooms once and then she understood and it was because of her experience of seeing threads everywhere throughout the universe. Again, you could say, oh, it's just UPG, blah, blah. I, I hate discounting that. When UPG becomes the um, the argument, then that's where I have an, an issue. But we should pay attention more to people's subjective experiences, just understand the difference between subjective experiences and objective reality, I guess. But either way, she told me that um, she had, you know, had that experience about seeing threads throughout the entire you know, world and universe. And um, that's all she needed to do was just once she got her answer. That's what I mean, you know? Hmm. Yeah. So you she's, understand. She's that. never looked at the world the same after that, you know, and she doesn't need mushrooms to do divination at all. You should be able to get into that state without the dependence. Exactly. I mean, if it was so useful, everybody, you know, it would be a human nature to be having mushrooms all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, and Scott, like I said, I'm in the, yeah, yeah, sorry. For people at home that don't, they're meatheads like me. Uh, what does UPG stand for? You can go ahead with that if you want, John, because you, yeah, it's unverified um, personal hypnosis, but yeah. I'm sure John has. But well, you've yeah. got a view on this. Yeah, I've got, you know, I'm a very practical, I'm really just non magic believing kind of guy. And so, if, you know, to me, everything that, that we perceive happens within the brain. I mean, the, you know, the world we see around us isn't the world around us is how our brain interprets the world around us so anything that you know alters out how, how brains work and, and perceives things that you know is only real to ourselves that's how i look at it your but, brain your brain reads information like a digital camera and then tells you and, and yeah that interprets it so so you know, i don't know if green to me looks like the green to you for example you know, you know so there's, you know, no, there's it's like, absolutely you know, right yeah that part i mean because like you know, there's this famous article by Berlin and Kay, um, written back in the 60s or 70s. They're linguistic anthropologists. And um, they would talk about how different cultures have different colors, right? Mm. And how they view the world. So, um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But but there's a consciousness thing as well. I mean, we could go off, right off peak. And, you know, so there's a view that consciousness is actually outside the brain and, and is across the universe. And so, we are just living entities grabbing onto a bit of consciousness. When we die, we really go of it and the consciousness continues. And so it could be believed that everything has attachment to consciousness. That's a whole that's a whole different video of Zoom call and 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 one I'm not an expert in. But biocentricism. <laughs> uh and, it, and it, it's an interesting to to listen to you know these thoughts and discussions. They need to be had, you know, to either give them some credibility or to discount them. So it's, it's worth talking about them. Um, but I certainly believe that the taking of psychedelics or, or such things only affects you. It doesn't give you a, a sense of the greater universe. As I say, I'm just a practical mythologist. And uh, yeah, so my views. I don't know. Yeah, I would say that it, it helps you interact with that other, the other, if you will. Mm -hmm. So to be, to 
make it totally separate. I don't, I don't know if I would agree, politely, I don't know if I'd agree with it, but yeah, that's what you say. I've never, but I, do, I, I know um, what you mean. I mean, I come from an organization too, where we're very much focused on, on the self and the will. I mean, we're very, very inner. Um, and you know, I've, some of us believe that like you were saying, everything comes from within. So I can definitely sympathize with your points for sure. You know, but then, then again, too, that's also very different from people who are very devotional and they pray to Thor or something like that, you know? So, um, yeah. So that, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but I thought there was something that started the universe. I mean, I'd, I'd spend the rest of my life trying to work out what it was, which is what I guess religion is in a way you put it down and I've got better things to do, like drink tea and talk mythology than wonder yeah. how this all started because that, that isn't going to change anything. that's like the the fundamental human question right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now that we, we understand more about what runes are which i think this this has so far been the most entertaining and thorough discussion as to what runes even are uh yeah let's get into their origins so scott uh you mailed you you helped me with starting this uh the hava mauled and sigurdru mall did i say that correctly uh, Sigurdry from all. Sigurdry from all. Um, so let's start with talking about the Havamal. That's the creation myth of the runes. Nice. To give us at least just a starting overview. All right. Uh, explain this to me very quickly. Uh, as if I'm 16 years old, my only spiritual interaction is going to church. So there are, and John can actually help me out here too, because there are many religions that have divine origin stories tied to alphabets. Right. Uh, you're muted. Oh, or wait. Am I? Am I muted? Oh no, no, you're not now. Yeah. Okay. It was, um, I... I'm not. I'm not aware of any specific myths about that. There may be folklore, but I'm aware of beliefs that words were magic. The only one that comes to my mind right now is Egypt. Yes. Yes. So the creation. You know, Pitar said words, and they happened. Mm -hmm. Touched on it. I think before we started recording on the Bible, in the creation myths of the Bible. So the Bible has multiple creation myths within it. Um, and one of them is when God's created the world, he says, uh, let there be light and there was light and let there be stars and there were stars. And, it, and, and that is a take on Egyptian uh, mythology. So where they have a creation myth of Ptah who just says the word and the word comes into being. Now, Egypt has also multiple creation myths um, from, from various beings, deities they consider the creator, but Ptah is the one which seemed to be the most popular at the time the Genesis story was written. And so it was taken. Um, but just just to add note, we also see Sumerian mythology in there as well, with with further creation. That's completeness. But that's where that's where the word is. But as I said, I am aware that priests were also considered magical because they could read words. But I wouldn't necessarily connect any divine creation with words, like that outside of Egypt. I mean, I had a little look on the. Um, mythology database I, I run and um, there, there's nothing obvious to me but if you have examples Scott, i'll be happy to divine stories um tied to the gods for example bringing the the quote-unquote alphabet to a people and the and they 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 put it in that sort of mythic context so the thing is, is the greeks had it okay so the greeks do and john i can email this to you because like i said i do i talked about it in my dissertation i know it's there i just wasn't prepared for that question. So the Greeks actually had it within this sort of mythic context, and they had a, a story as to how these letters came to us. Um, but by the time it got to the Romans, it was kind of devoid of those mythic connotations. I mean, because they're, they're pretty Christian now. And but we do have this, we do have one story that was recorded by the Romans, saying how the, the alphabet uh, came in through the gods through a sort of divine way as well but that that's that's i can't remember who that was and you know what this is going to bug the hell out of me so i'm going to come back when this video is up and i'm going to put a comment with all this information in there because it's going to bug me um but either way uh for the romans it was pretty much devoid of the mythic connotations and the mythic you know origins of writing so that's also very different though for the tribes because bringing it back now to the divine origin of the runes we have a divine origin story of the runes that was clearly invented by them because where else would it have come from? 
I mean, so yeah, the divine origin of the runes, as far as uh, for your viewers who don't know, Odin had hung himself on the tree for nine days and nine nights. Um, he went through arguably a shamanic ritual of some sort through starvation and dehydration and pain. And then when he had, he had come to, uh, the runes had sort of been revealed to him. So that's that's what we're dealing with here. Yeah, that's a very famous passage. That's where Odin hangs himself from a tree, which has nothing to do with Jesus being on a cross for all those who often say it's an analogous story. It is not in any way. All right, so it's the Nordic one-off in yeah. terms of their own mythology. Well, can you talk about it, how it doesn't have anything to do with a cross too? I mean, I, I'm convinced, but people who haven't been studying this stuff for a while are going to make that old Sophist Buga argument and uh it's you know, all people like to call him buggy but <laughs> yeah and, and, and the words i mean uh i think anatoly lieberman in his book prayer and laughter which i know you're very familiar with he, he writes an excellent article about it or, or talks about it i'm sure in there um but it's just the way odin the, the wording of the poem is odin is hanging on a tree he's not being put on a cross and yes a spear goes in his side and people want to say oh that's and just but it's all part of shamanistic ritual it is the, the, the starvation is you know torture is, is torture but he isn't dying and being reborn like jesus was you know and yeah you know, and, and we could talk about right that really and how you know that wasn't really a sacrifice because if god knew he could revive jesus then he isn't really giving up anything letting jesus be on the cross that's just cool getting your son be tortured like that so um so that was the basis of it you know odin got something he made a sacrifice and got something back from it jesus you could argue sacrifice his life but he didn't really because he knew, he yeah knew it's a totally him. different intent right yeah. i mean exactly. exactly in old norse it says uh siel ver siel ver mier, right self to self, exactly. um, self to myself, which yeah. jesus would be like huh <laughs> you know it's like self for to other for him mm. um so there's also this one this one stanza in hovamol and the larrington translation that i'm looking at anyway it says uh, that is now proved what you ask of the runes of divine origin, which the great gods made. It's never really said who made them. It's just this weird nebulous great gods like the uh, Ginregan, you know, yeah, made the them. Yeah, beings or whatever. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. And the mighty sage colored, and people think that that's Odin. Um, then it is best for him to say si if he stays silent. Um, I think that's a beautiful passage. It's, you know, it's like of divine origin – um what does that mean well well first off I, I can tell you that the runes being of divine origin um is very old it's it's almost germanic rather than just specific specifically scandinavian so if you look at the nolaby rune stone it actually says that these runes were made by the divine gods so and that's uh i think the nolaby rune stones around like 500 or so 500 600 B, uh, ce rather yeah so that's really interesting um so we have the mythic origins there in stanza 80 and then we have the mythic origins with odin hanging on the tree um so yeah uh any anything you want to add to that i guess as far as religious... oh, i think i think that's a perfect example I mean, it is written in black and white you know it's it's, it's hard to interpret the the whole more that, that those lines in the whole more linear way other than they are divine origin uh, and yes, I, I wasn't aware of the, the rune stone of about 500 uh, CE, but that's that's good. I mean, but, and that's maybe 500 years after the, the start of runic use in, in these regions, I guess. So he, he suggests that yeah, the connection between word and and the runes had been established already by them. I mean, they'd, they'd written... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because in the Nullaby runestone, it's kind of interesting. It's really weird because it says that a divine, depending on your translation, but it does use the singular word rune. So it doesn't say like the runes specifically, uh, but it actually talks about the one rune, the one mystery rune, right? So people have said, okay, well, it's not really that interesting. It just means the message. Okay, fine. You or know, poem or was a, yeah, whatever. Or the poem. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And then that, but we mustn't underestimate what that really means because it was poetry was your form of immortality. So, mm -hmm. you know, people carry on saying your name or telling stories about you. That was that was your aim in life. Yeah, well, one of your 
you know, you, know, you wanted to be remembered, you want to do great deeds. And I guess to have to, to not just yeah. have stories spoken about you, but then to have them written about you, that might have been quite an amazing thing. Oh, yeah, thing for sure. Doing. I mean, the whole nexus of fame and immortality and poetry. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with How to Kill a Dragon. What, not what, the movie. What, what, <laughs> or yeah. Tame a yeah. Dragon, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Train your dragon movie. I think, I think, yeah, fame, um, it's Watkins, yeah, Watkins, yes. Uh, is uh, was it fame can never die or something? Is it fame? Well, he has a whole chapter in there, okay, yeah, fame must not decay, which is basically yeah. okay. Um, so, real, real quick before we change, because I wanted to say I have my translation for the Nobleby runestone here, okay. um, so that way your, your viewers can at least know what I'm talking about here. So, it's I, um for Hakuthus, prepare a bright, divinely de derived rune. And then it has a bunch of gobbledygook gibberish. So it's really weird and interesting um, because my interpretation of this is I, the rune master, for this other person, Hakuthus, prepare a bright, divinely derived rune. And then it's Una Thol Suruha Susie nitta like it doesn't it's no it's it's not mundane language anymore it's it's clearly just this garbledy gook and i've compared that to um and i'm not the only one but i have compared that to like the greek magical papyri where you use like aphasia grammaton you know um where you're you're speaking in tongues essentially uh and yeah, I don't know if you you would add to that or if you have nothing to add to that. But well, I think, yeah, certainly the vocalization of sounds is important. Yeah, whether that's speaking in tongues or if that is a spell from a proto language, you know, still existing or who knows. It's um, and if it's if it's said by someone of importance with intent, as you say, then it is taken as a a very important message, which is that rune, which is what it's trying to say. And this right, spell, this poem, this whatever it is. And what's interesting about it too is that the reason, and now now that it's coming back to me, the reason I was making that argument is because um, it says either rune master for Hakathus or I for Hakathus prepare a bright divinely derived rune. What is that? It has to be that message that comes afterwards. That's just in a bunch of different runic characters. But white? Do do you mean like their use of white as in sort of a clean pure? Bright, or good, bright and shining, bright and or shining. Or is this a, yeah. is this like a sun reference? Like this is a life giver, a creator kind of element to it. Well, the argument is made by Krause back in the '60s, uh, basically, who said he he talked about right, uh, uh, sorry, runes coming from the, the the bright gods within the sky and stuff like that. So that's where he's coming from, and I just adopted that part of the interpretation. Okay. That's My next question: If you if if it was not uh, the most just clear, one quickly, just just quick... the polarity thing. Sorry, John. I was just going to say Cadmus, I believe, is the mythology, uh, the Greek character in the myth. You're talking about divine origins of the alphabet. Thank you. See, I know I'm not crazy. Well, in that, I don't know the myth, but uh... that respect anyway. <laughs> yeah okay thank you now, now i'm thinking about that old translation you did on that sword that said i the wily one <laughs> your words are forever now echoing in my brain <laughs> okay but i do have a question though um going back earlier into the poem when you were talking about the sage and it's not a reference to odin no, it probably is a reference to Odin. Oh, probably is. Okay. Yeah. So then I was going to ask, is this going into something or saying something about uh, either the user? Uh, but if this is about Odin, uh, would that mean uh, people within the Norse or users of the runes are trying to be a sage like Odin now? See, I would, I personally would say when it comes to that, um, as far as him being the great sage and people actually trying to reenact um, these myths and magical practices. Yes, I would say that. Uh, how common is that, uh, John, as far as um, taking some of these myths like this and reenacting them? I mean, I, I think it is pretty common. I mean, if you read Mer Mercea yeah. Eliada, Eliada talks about yeah, it. So, yeah, yeah, ritual, yeah, ritual is the way to enforce belief. 
you know, you just do it again and again. So absolutely. I mean, be, what interests me about Odin is uh, who actually is he, which is on a, a whole different conversation. But, um, but he may have, you know, there, there was a a god, Othor, I think he's... Um, yeah, Othor. Um, it may be more relatable to him, or it may not, because um, some people say it's related to Dwothu and then the, the, the wild hunt rather than poetry, which is because the name of is multiple. Yeah, Lieberman talked about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, yeah, so um, that's interesting. So it's, 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 it's quite, and now then also being a, a more of a, a god for the higher echelons of society rather than the warriors and then the providers. So th does that mean he is a god for the priests as well as the kings? And if so, then that makes sense that priests would try to emulate that. Because my view of the old Nordic um, pantheon is that they, unlike the, we sort of associate Greeks with like, gods of thunder and sea and that, it, it, to me, the gods of the old Norse texts were gods that people wanted to try and emulate. So they were like characters, ideal characters for different people. So if you wanted to be a warrior, Thor, if you wanted to be a king, maybe Odin, but if you you know, and it, it had a multiple of attributes associated with it. So yeah, so uh, I totally agree with that. Um, is that coming from this sort of uh, George's Dumasil plus Kershaw approach? I guess oh, that's, that's just me stirring. Okay, up so yeah, because George's yeah. Dumasil basically. John says, so yeah, like you know, George's Dumasil believes you know in the, this sort of tripartite theory. Yeah, oh, your my part I, I do i see so much of that it's it's right I'm, i'll even see it in the bible the, in daniel sure. nine has got, has got they, they talk about a statue with a head and a body and the legs all different okay Italy, which is you know, the, the sacrifice mm -hmm. so it's, and so it's, yeah so like these people for example if you have a farmer um you know why would the farmer want to respectfully why would the farmer want to work so much with odin does exactly. it make sense it makes more sense for him to arguably work with rare Exactly. Right. So, but, um, yeah. And then when it comes to like the reason I mentioned a name dropped, basically Kershaw. <laughs> uh, the reason I mentioned him is because he talks about how another example. Let's just use a the warrior function and the king function. He talks about how these tribes would get together and embody the 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 form of Odin when they go into war, or embody the form of Thor when they go into the war. So it's not. I'm not saying that there was no worship. I'm not going to say that, but there's that also that sense of yes, there may be worship, but I think what we're what we're missing nowadays for a lot of these these modern groups is ritual participation and in, in in embodying those aspects. It almost feels external to me. I've been to many events, many different types of events, seeing people and how they do their workings and and stuff, and I don't actually really typically see mythic reenactment as much as this weird like external thing like thank yeah, you so much. and that's okay. it um yeah. yeah small digression there but um, no, I, I, I agree and there's a few points there but i'd certainly agree that people who try to reenact old rituals do a very poor job um and probably wouldn't even want to do yeah. what was done in those rituals if they really knew what was going on um, yeah, there are some pretty gruesome ones. Yeah, exactly. Um, or the early gruesome too, really, really yeah. weirdly sexual and yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and the other thing was the tripartite system. I, I don't know if you did you want to expand on that, Garrett? Do you want to understand what that is while we're talking about that? Or is... Yeah, let's, let's go into it. There's yeah, okay, people probably please... watching this right now who or will be watching this that will have no clue what you're talking about. Okay, so, so briefly, I'll explain it in a mythological context. So uh, in the beginning, there were two primordial beings, Menu and, and Yemo, or in Old Norse, well, actually, let's call it the Indo-European, because it's safe confusion. There was Manu, meaning man, and Yemo, his twin. And they wanted to create a world, so Yemo said he would sacrifice himself. Manu sacrifices Yemo, and from his body builds the world. And, you know, his uh, bones are the rocks, his flesh is the earth, his blood is the sea, you get... All this and this appears in many other myths. Um, but then he built molds people on the world, and what he does is he builds um priests from the head, from the body, he builds warriors, and from the legs, he builds the providers or, or the farmers. And the king is a combination of all a bit of the leg, a bit of the body, and a bit of the head because the king then can understand what it is to be a priest and a warrior and a farmer, making him a good king, but also because the king is then 
built from all parts of the body that was used to build the world, the king is also in touch with the land. And so the land is the king and the king is the land. So we also see other mythology about if the land is poor, then the king isn't doing a good job. Or if the king loses an arm, he can't look after the land, so he's not doing a good job. But that's the basis of it, that the primordial being, had uh, his body was used to build different, different parts of the body was used to build different people in society. Happy with that, Scott? Does that... No, it does. Yeah, no, that, that's pretty much, pretty much it. And then um, I really like what you said too about the king being the land as well, mm. um, okay. rather than again something that's just kind of like the ruler of the land. It's like it's kind of like the exactly. same thing. And that's exactly why you have sacrifice. So in some myths, you see, um, you you reenact this by when you had human sacrifices, you'd kill a human as Manu killed Yemo, and you'd give his head to the priests and the body also to the warriors and the legs to the farmers and they would theoretically eat them well they eventually change into a cattle but we do have some descriptions of cattle being sacrificed and how their parts were split up amongst the you know, value that the other tribe leaders that were around at the sacrifice you know, so the head went to the important people the body went to the less important people the, the worst parts of the cow went to the, the the poor people or the criminals as well but that is in effect the cosmogony of the indo-european society that that you know you sacrifice a body and give it back to the people and that goes back to the land when they die and when you're born the land is given you the materials to be build your body and i love it i think it's beautiful honestly and uh it yeah it really um is reflective in even the myth of emir you know yeah absolutely yeah very much so it's inflected in, in iran persian vedic greek roman even romulus remus is a, is a sort of remake of it um, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these so these myths too are these ancient people of manuals. These are the textbooks on how you do all these practices. Then. I mean, yeah. Do you want to tackle that but, then? Yeah. But Barnes and Noble didn't exist back then, so. What? So what? Do you, how? How? What? How do people learn these? Do you mean the practices or why or? It's just speech. yeah. Well, that's just something that was that's been coming to mind since we started talking about the Havamal. The myth uh, gets ritual. So in ritual we get the religion. So you have a story of why things happen and you enact that story to make it to remember it and to in effect put that magic or whatever you want to call it back into the world, you know, to, to praise the gods, to remember the gods. And that's that's it. That's just a that's just human nature. And I think humans have been well, doing that. Yeah, well not just on uh not to interrupt you, not just like on a, okay, like the you know, this is our homage to the gods, this myth that we keep talking about or praising them with. But this is also like like a how-to. Like this becomes your your uh, your fundamental learning on how this practice or these practices would work or to teach you what like what the magic or what the rituals that the cosmogony because that, that that's learned in the ritual. I mean where it starts, who I mean the story or the thought, and I think it may have been Lincoln, who who was a student of Eliade, uh, wrote about this, and because he was talking about this cosmogony, and he was saying that there was in reality no first sacrifice. It just there was one before that, and one before that, and one before that for infinitum. Yeah, but they had the story of of creation in there. So, so they didn't it doesn't fit logically, but you know the, the view is you just reenact the myth. And that's how you learn. That's why you do it. And you and you know, and whilst you're doing it, you're telling the stories. I mean, if you've ever read the Havamal, it's it's not a two minute poem. <laughs> it's a it's a you know you can take a good hour to read the, the, the Havamal and and enact it and, and make it a a show a ritual. Um, so yeah, and, and there are many like this. And, and what we also find, so because they're poetry, you shouldn't be able to forget the words too easily. But we do find that there are aspects of various poems that even if you did forget the words, there were common rhymes used in language that you could just put fillers into and, and still tell the story. So it's basically learning long songs and enacting them out. And that's, that's your Barnes and Noble of 2000 BCE. What would have been the term that they would have used back then for people that would use runes? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, oof. There actually is an attestation of a rune master in one of the old Norse texts. I think it only occurs like once. Okay. So I'm going to go with rune master. 
Okay, with a rune master. All it's right. like it's a rune rune mystery. Yeah. Rune mystery. Yeah, John's John's like what? I didn't know that exists. I did. I didn't know that. That's that's good news to me. Yeah, let me actually. We'll keep, we'll keep talking and I'll find it. My research could be uh, not correct, um, but Odin was the master of magic. That's an interesting title to give him, Garrett. Um, but he, he certainly, yeah, master of poetry, and poetry was magical. So okay. you could, you know, imply that he therefore yeah, is the master of magic. It makes him sound more like a, you know, David Copperfield than than a god. Um, <laughs> I don't, okay. but, yeah, I've never heard him called the you know, the magic wasn't a word that I'm aware of used back then. And they had a term word, um, but yeah, I'm not too sure. Was was magic a, a natural word, Scott? Do you know back then? I mean, I'm, I, I know sorry, we translate. Which term, word was it? John? Which word? Magic. Was, the, was there actually a term? Now I know there's a term word which we sort of. Oh, there were all kinds of different words for magic in Old Norse. Um, Leolf, which is coincidentally a song, poem, and it also okay. means magic. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's, of course, Galdr mm -hmm. is another one, um, in which case, if you trace back that word, uh, well, actually, if you just look at the verbal form, Gala, it means to cry out. Um, it also is tied to like a rooster call. like So um again magic yes, and, and yes. vocal components and stuff like that so but, but it wasn't a term sort of magic or magic was yeah you know, apart from words i mean if you know of course if there was magic like that it would just be borrowed yeah but yeah you know so, and that that word's a video in itself okay it was there separate um so are these like separate descriptives for the kind of magic yeah yeah there's like say there's and then there's uh Galder and then uh, like Leolf, like I was saying, um, but at least the not say there, but the other two are again just tied to the vocal component of performing magic. Um, but then again, John, if you're like, well, was there a word for magic? Well, you know, what is magic? <laughs> so exactly, yeah, yeah. As I say, I, 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 on, I guess magic because yeah, I actually or, talked about like, that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I was just saying, I, I always consider magic more David Copperfield than miracles and like it's it's more of a oh, so more like see like yeah, so more like illusion or something yes. like that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there was. I don't know it off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, David Copperfield does do some miracles, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be the ongoing joke now. My new hashtag, David Copperfield does miracles. Um, okay, so we get into the Havamal where uh, Odin has made uh, these these runes. Um, and this might be too... Did he make the runes? That's a good point. He, uh, he discovered the runes. Yeah, no, sorry for saying, or sorry, oh, I should have jumped in there too. Yeah, no, he didn't make them. He, he They were already in existence. And he okay. went through that whole ordeal, that sort of shamanistic ordeal, and then it was sort of like revealed to him. Yeah. Okay, so is there an indicator that someone else made them? Or they were already made, but now Odin did this and he understands, oh, you can use them for these purposes? Well, there is that vague verse, right, that I read initially from Halvamol, um, that said that the divine gods had created them, but it's very vague. Who are the divine gods? You can make an argument. I mean, if you would like, it doesn't mean you're right, <laughs> by the way. People... An argument is an argument. It's not fact. Mm -hmm. Arguments are meant to be argued against. That's writing 101. So anyway, so you can make an argument as to as to as far as like who the divine gods are but it's very vague in the text it's it's like who are the gin reagan like mm -hmm. that's that's what that is it's like gin is this weird that that's what the the divine gods are the gin reagan and gin is like this weird um word that we still don't technically know what it means um it's been suggested that the gin is related to the gin as in beginning 
So because it it does make sense for begin it to, to it could be a it could be a prefix the b right so but no I mean I'm not I'm not I don't know what it means oh, 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 now I'm gonna ask you this Scott out of just theoretical question um, so could this potentially indicate that Odin is a minor god a different form of god. Um, there are creator gods, or is this like an Egyptian thing where there's different generations of God? That, that's a John question. <laughs> well, I'm going to upset many people if you want me to answer that question. Well, you've already done a few videos that upset people on this. Yes. If so, you're yeah. not upsetting people, John, you're not doing it right. <laughs> so, um, so to me, Odin is a relatively new God on the scene. Um, and I actually believe Odin, uh, and I think I mentioned this before last time we spoke, uh, Scott, a couple of months ago, uh, briefly, is that I think Odin re replaced Manu in the myths. So so when I talked about the myth of creation with Manu sacrificing Nemo, uh, Manu the first man, and, and we see generally that Manu comes down to the earth and teaches through ritual sacrifice how to keep the world in order. And we see that Manu exists in Tacitus' writings of Germania. He talks about Manus and, and Twisco. Uh, but when we get into Scandinavian, a thousand years later, Manu's gone. But who sacrifices Yumo and who creates people? It's Odin. And it's Odin with William Vey or Odin with uh, uh, Lothar and Umir. Um, Onir, as I think it is. Um, so and, and it's quite interesting who those people are who really were really and vain and, and that and i think that's all comes about to a bit of myth we've probably missing which has helped manu be removed and odin to be put in place so i yeah to me could odin have come along because of writing almost oh yeah you know, that's yeah you know, the, the dates aren't too dissimilar um but I, I, I don't know. But that's that's my my high level view. But as you say, I've done many videos about it. For anyone who wants to to go through my thoughts and and that, then I'm not saying it's definitely the case. Again, it's an argument. As I just said, these 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 things are, are to be said. But I, I think I've got a very good case um, for saying that Manu has disappeared from myth and Odin has turned up, and that is not a coincidence. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I, you said he showed up because of writing, but yeah, I don't know. Um, he could have also, you know, been a part of the the war. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. So, so yeah. So I'm talking about Odin, the materialistic figure god. Oh, okay. that, and like, because there's already Othor there. Um, but Odin name, like in terms, of, turned up because I think we have Oth Othor, who's I think is more friended and and world hunting. You know, had those gods there. It's just the the personification of him, maybe is the best word. Turned yeah, up. yeah, I see what you're saying. But, yeah, I like that too, especially since they're, they're like his name actually means inspiration. So hmm. okay, his oh, they're in inspiration, but yes, it does also mean mad, ecstatic, insane. Um, apparently in Iceland, if you are almost blacked out drunk, they use that word <laughs> in Iceland. I actually talked to an Icelander about that. He was telling me about different stages of being drunk <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, you can use the word other if you're drunk, you know, but you are like, you're like sleeping outside on the lawn drunk, you know, <laughs> looking for the wounds. Apparently, half hammered looking for the runes. Maybe that's what it's all about. A drunk guy just fell onto a tree, or someone hung a drunk guy on a tree. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was like, uh, I know that that rune master word does exist. I'm going to put that in the comments too. Can't find it right now, um, but I will put that in the comments. A friend of mine. Yeah, no, it was a big deal because a friend of mine, um, he also has a PhD from Amherst over in Massachusetts in Germanic linguistics, and uh, he found it. And he was like, look, it's right here. And he had texted me or either texted me or put or emailed me, and I, I can't find it right now. Right. But um, now, I'm gonna... now, Scott, can I ask on just a little analysis or theory on your end on um, 
on this divine the divine god i really don't have one um to be honest with you like it's just like this nebulous gin reagan right so what i was going to say too about gin reagan first off what that means is gin could mean something that's just magical and very vague um and then the reagan is just like the rulers or the counselors so it's like really like the great magical divine advisors and counselors that's what we do know about that word um but as far as like a class of gods i don't know i mean if you want me to sit here and make an argument as to how it could be the s here i could but again at the end of the day it's just an argument you know it's still um, makes an interesting video i i just i'm not the type that likes to just talk you know it's like a, when i talk i want to at least feel like i have something to say and be convincing about it yeah well i mean at least at, at least we're learning yeah i know what, it's just what like the i don't like to mean. open I don't really like to opine very much. I just find opinions to be worthless. <laughs> <laughs> opinions, not arguments, but opinions. Of course. Uh, yeah, but I mean, like, it's always it's always good to get the educated, the educated opinion or the educated guess. Um, yeah, I mean, but again, if I'm being honest with you, I just don't really, I don't really know other than just saying that they are the, you know, the the magical divine advisors. Who are they? Are, are they associated with the Ganunga get? Because yeah, well, the, the, the Genung, is, yeah, exactly. The Genung is, is actually, yeah, the Genung was, I'm sorry, uh, was supposed to be the gun and begin, rather. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, that's what that was supposed to be. Um, but it, it, it's supposed to be related to the Gin and Genung and Gin Regan and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Has hung himself on the tree and, uh, through the divine advisors, um, learns how the uh runes <clears throat> runes can be used uh where where do we go next does he like bring it to the people or is this just something in writing in the poem left for the left for the viewers to now know and then they can go forth and start their their studies good question so um you know, after what, what's important here too, let's let's talk about this Halvamal stanza with, with hanging on the tree. It's very significant. It's arguably one of the most important stanzas in the entire corpus. And you know, what happens is that when he goes through this self-sacrifice, he takes a drink of Oath River. When he takes that drink from Oath River, which is the meat of poetry that John was talking about earlier, that's when magical things start to happen. So I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Um, and it actually probably will answer your question. So once he drinks Oath River, which, by the way, means the stirrer of inspiration, the rearer of inspiration. Once he drinks from that, this is what he says. Then I began to quicken and to be wise and to grow and to prosper. One word from another word found a word from me. One deed from another deed found a deed for me. The runes you must find and meaningful letters, very great letters, very stiff letters, which the mighty sage colored and the huge powers the Ginregan made and the rune master of the gods carved out. Then it says, Odin among the Asir, and Dain among the elves, Dvalin among the dwarves, Alsfeed among the giants, I carved some for myself. Which is kind of interesting because you have like the Odin like in first person and then in third person, uh, you know, but then people have also made the argument too that especially in this particular stage of hollow malt, it's an initiatory process. So the person that's saying I is almost like the initiate. Yeah, the initiate either way. Um, but then it says, do you know how to carve the runes, right? Do you know how to interpret them? Do you know how to color them? Do you know how to question them? Do you know how to ask them? Do you know how to sacrifice? Do you know how to send them? What is sending? You know, that's a good question. I, Lieberman talks about sending, and but anyway, do you know how to sacrifice them? So it's like, okay, as, as far as to is like physical runes and physical letters, it's like I get that with carve and color, you know, but what do you mean sending? and and slaughtering or, or sacrificing it's kind of strange 
Um, so yeah, that answers your question, I think, where it says with regarding the runes, Odin among the Asir, Dine among the elves, Valen for the dwarfs, Alsfeed among the giants, and I carved some for myself. Does not say that he gave runes to the humans in Midgard. No. That's for you to figure out. <laughs> well, no, but but he did drop some uh, meat of poetry via his anus as an eagle. Yeah, he, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did defecated it out of there. Yes. <laughs> and that's how we got our knowledge, the little bit we have. Hmm. Okay. And then there's, you know what, John, I want to ask you about this because that verse continues, or the, the, the poem continues into this next verse. Better not to pray than to sacrifice too much. One gift always calls for another. Better not dispatched than too many slaughtered. Okay. This is the Larrington translation, by the way. So thunder or thund carved before the close of the nation's history. Dot, 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 okay. When he rose up and he came back. So that is like this what does that mean do you, i mean I, I do you have any idea what that really means as that, far that's as a really interesting stanza so certainly the first part and it is when people are performing these rituals reenactments i do let them know this because they, they, they seem to be unaware that you shouldn't sacrifice too much because right right you're not you should not give too much and that's a really important thing because some people who are really into religious thoughts of the, these ways you know praise odin all the time or something like that and it's yeah, just, yeah. you're not you haven't got the point you don't worship odin you don't praise him all the time he's there yeah he doesn't really care about you you know he's you he's That's there to inspire you true. Yes. You know, he, he, he's there to inspire you to be a better king or, or priest of course yes um yes. so but but to die and resurrect yeah that's uh, to me that's in effect it's, it's just your knowledge you 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 turn from being innocent to uh, being aware i'm not i, I don't see it as a physical okay. um transformation i see it more as a an intellectual transformation no that's that's great that's that's kind of how i have worked with that too just wanted to get your opinion on that really cool that's good like, yeah his chat started off like we have to get the, the, the boxing ring and yeah they're hugging now because it's all yeah. And um, so, uh, Garrett, something that's also interesting too is that uh, the Old Norse verse, when it's when it's when Havamal closes, it's Nu eru Havamal kveden hava hutlu i, althor fita sonam, althor fiatna sonam, hail sarkvad, hail sarkan, nioti sar nam hail uthers vidu. So it, what that means is. Um, now are the high ones now is the high ones song recited apparently to larrington and um in the high ones hall very useful to the sons of men but useless to the sons of the yotams so these runes right these songs um so it's yeah anyway so i'll just finish reading her translation so i'll just start at the beginning now the high one song is recited in the high ones hall very useful to the sons of men quite useless to the sons of men i'll get back to that in a second luck to him luck to him who recited luck to him who knows may he benefit he who learn it luck to those who have listened um the original manuscript does actually say sons of men twice but it doesn't make sense to say very useful to the sons of men and then quite useless to the sons of men <laughs> so um people have amended that to the sons of giants useless to the sons of giants but okay um yeah no, it's just helpful. kind of interesting that the yotans are um kind of put on the periphery and and whatnot but well, that, that's a, okay so this is another side topic to discuss yotans then because I, I hear you say giants quite a lot when you say Yutton. I do too, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and does that make, do you think that, that they represent or do you think they just represent a different culture or a different tribe, a different race? Yeah, um, I, I think it's more like a different tribe slash race slash class of beings. Um, it, it like, like they don't um, have like what the fairies might be in the Irish Celtic where they're this being of people that's metaphysical or is it just reference to a different group of people no i mean 
well, I, I think John's point is that there's nothing giant in stature about the Jotun. Mm. That's that's and, and so it's this weird yeah, yeah. translation. Giants aren't yeah. big, so that's a common misconception that giants are big. Patar it was, is actually, he, yeah, and he was about. Yeah, exactly. You have three different types of giants, really. You have the the Thurs, and you have the Jotun. And Thurs is there are always this. There there are never any positive situations which in which you would encounter a Thurs. So they're the again giant, which is I, and we got to get rid of that translation. It's just so ingrained in our culture because of all the different translations over the years. Because um, yeah, uh, the Thurs are more about just um, very destructive. You know, they're very destructive beings. And then the other one is the Riss, which is German Riese. Uh, that is a giant. It's like they're compared to mountains. Yeah. Um, but you don't find that word for, for giant in the old Norse corpus, except for maybe if you find it at all, maybe like once. Um, but it becomes very popular in the folklore later. Of course, with like the giants and being associated with the mountains and Thor and thunder and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. but because that's the only one that would be appropriate to say giant, you know? Yeah. It touched me. I do think, I, I think hidden within the Assyrian veneer are different religious beliefs and yeah. hidden within. I can the, see that. I can definitely yeah. see that. And yeah. the, so, yeah. so is there, yeah. So, how did the word giant or that translation become ingrained in our culture? That's archaic. Uh, translations which are public domain used over and over again so like a like was this from like victorian era 1700s oh no well, well 1900s early 1900s you found that was a common, and people basically copied each other's translations refer to them and reused them and so and it still happens today yeah and occasionally people go out on a limb and, and change things but um yeah okay it's just it, it, people are used to saying that yeah, and then you get Marvel come along or Disney or whoever, and, and then just... yeah, good old. And game. then that makes it ten times worse. Exactly. You know? yeah. Exactly. So your yeah. audience and they're seeing planets that are called Vanaheim and stuff like that, which is totally way off. And... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Regions of land. So yes, so so I do believe there's a, a good description of, of the geographical, uh, the environment, and societal constructs within yeah. those words. Okay. Yeah, we've lost those but i didn't know you wanted to talk more about the translation um scott yeah we wanted to to talk about yeah the the, the it could harm people to know the runes or, or not what you know the what people, sorry. yeah so it's when you talked about the um depending on the translation uh the the end says um you said good you know, I've, my own translation is about you know, these are the words of odin spoken in so his halls and and they're the, oh they're yeah help. the closing verse for all of them all men so they said it can be used either way and it and it basically says you know good health to you who speak them or read them or or know them um and happiness to those who learn them in effect yeah you know, so it's just a sign of but, but but which could harm all men as you say or harm mutants or harm a what well, I, I didn't know if we know what that really meant or if that gave us any clues on um how they thought they had them. any clues as far as so as far as it being helpful to the sons of men but no help to the sons of Jotuns? yeah is it is it just like because if people don't believe our beliefs they can't use these is it is it is oh i see so you're going back to like the modern sort of yeah. yeah well i mean the thing is is like i'm not i i can't tell people what they can and can't do you know obviously so people are gonna just do what they want um but I would argue that it's not very effective um, if you're not operating within the context. If you're not, and that, that's just, that's almost fact, right? I mean, so if you think about like the mythic reenactments and stuff that you were talking about earlier, if you're not living, or like Levi Strauss would even say, like being a participant in the myth, then it's like this weird exterior thing. Like you're not really connecting. Um, you're like doing this, this, this reading or something in a very different context um, where, again, it would almost be like just putting a bunch of runes in a bowl and saying, here, pick one out mm -hmm. um, and, you know, draw lots, you know, draw lots in the sense of like who gets the shortest straw, right? Um, so, yeah, I just, I and again, I can't say like you can't do that and you're wrong 
uh, your interpretation is wrong. That is not how you do divination. Like, I'm not going to get into that. I mean, what's nice with, with me and that, all, that, that entire situation is I'm completely comfortable with myself and how I do it. I care less how somebody else does it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're not working within the context, within using mythic reenactment on some level, maybe creating some other spirit allies, depending on your intent, if you're not being very serious about it, I'll, I'll say if I, so in my case, if I weren't being very serious about it, I wouldn't get anything out of it at all. Mm -hmm. It would just feel like this shallow, um, shallow practice, you know, being a, with, I don't know if you've ever heard the term like a pick a wicca, <laughs> but basically what that is, is, um, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be a Wiccan, but just like a pagan practitioner who says, I'm going to be this religion today, and now I'm going to be this religion tomorrow, and I'm going to pick this one on Friday, and I'm going to, you know, they call it eclectic. I, I say that they, they call it, yeah, they call it eclectic. I just say it's people with commitment issues. But, <laughs> so, um, yeah. but no, it's, so what I'm saying is that like, no, but really it's like, if that works for you, that works for you. Uh, doesn't work for me. I need something deeper and more meaningful. So, and like I said too, like historically, all these people didn't really do that, right? They were they were really participating in the myth and reenacting it, and then working with these spirit allies. And you know, you have rituals that would be so involved and go on for days. Exactly, exactly. The ritual reconstructions there, you, know, you get twenty minutes standing by a tree or whatever, or a rock that you think is sacred. Yeah. And, and like, you can't yeah. do anything in that time. Yeah, you know, it's it's a day. Or two event to you know. no it is for sure i mean like i've been asked um i've been more and more open now just about my personal practices i just don't care i've burned so many bridges at this point it doesn't matter <laughs> so but um so what i'll say is that i've been asked to um do divination for someone um the average person you know they'll say okay sure you know i know how to read runes i'm going to do this divination practice in fact let me call you over the phone we'll do it right now that to me takes everything out of the proper context. So I, again, you do you, um, but I am not going to waste my time with that. I'm not going to insult the gods that way. I'm not going to insult the practice in that sense. My opinion, of course. But so I have done readings for people, but only in certain contexts. It depends. Do I know you really well? You know, um, Maybe I do, maybe I don't, but maybe your intent's very serious, and I want to get to know you a little bit before we do this. I want to write down some very important questions. I want to talk about the issues that you're dealing with. What is your goal to get out of this? Um, you know, I get very specific. And then what I do is I have a certain ritual structure that I follow that goes on for probably about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, that's being generous. But the thing is, is that that's like a very, very serious reading. And so what I'll do is I'll have the person come in with me. Let's say it's Garrett. I'll have him do certain things in the ritual with me. So he's a part of the ritual too. So, you know, I really bring in that other person to, to participate, whether it's banging on something, not necessarily a drum because that's not Germanic anyway, another discussion, <laughs> but um, whether it's banging on something or singing, singing i might say sing these rune sounds with me and like it's very involved and like i said i also work with mugwort a little bit um you know that's how i work but uh so getting back to your original question um does it work if somebody just pours runes you know that they bought from walmart into a bowl and say here pick one i can't say yes or no so if, if that works for you that works for you but it's very shallow to me and it just I, I couldn't connect at all so yeah. okay that's all i have to say <laughs> okay um well i think this could very well be a good way to just close out the interview for here we can carry on for the next part all right, gentlemen, I'm going to say thank you for now.